Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. And welcome to the Department of Labor, Francis Perkins Building. We are very happy to have you here. Uh, just a few housekeeping notice. Uh, the restrooms are in the back of you. In case of an emergency, we have exits to the front and exits to the back. I feel like I'm on a plane. Uh, so you can move forward quietly. Uh, and then we would like to ask you to please silence your phones as we continue. And now please rise with me as we do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I am Joan Harrigan Farrelly, Deputy Director of the Women's Bureau at the Department of Labor. And on behalf of the Women's Bureau, and on behalf of our director, Dr. Laurie Todd Smith, who sends her apologies for not being able to be here, I'd like to thank you for joining us today as we celebrate African American History Month, a conversation with military leaders on blazing trails in the armed forces. We are thrilled and honored to be co-hosting this event with Veterans Employment and Training Service, and you will hear from Cecile Hill later, uh, who will be representing vets. To give you a little bit of background on the Women's Bureau, we are an agency that is housed within the U.S. Department of Labor, focused on safeguarding the interests of working women, advocating for their equality and economic security, and promoting quality work environments. The Women's Bureau is the only federal agency tasked with representing the needs of working women in the public policy process. We accomplish our work through a combination of research, policy analysis, grant-making activities, education, and outreach. Our priorities range from exploring means of improving access to quality and affordable childcare for working families, to advocating for paid family leave, to expanding job opportunities for women in non-traditional occupations through apprenticeships, as well as helping to reduce barriers to employment for military spouses, 92% of whom are women. This is a big year for our agency. The Women's Bureau will celebrate its centennial anniversary on June 5th, 2020, and we look forward to seeing you for that great celebration. Please stay tuned. We will be having lots of events uh, leading up to that day and that day and going forward. For 100 years, the Women's Bureau has remained committed to focusing on the issues working women care about most. And coincidentally, this is also the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and women getting the right to vote. Yay for that too. <laughs> Our centennial is not only a significant milestone for the Women's Bureau, but it is also noteworthy for all working women across the country. It honors the progress that women have made in the labor force while acknowledging and paving the road for the progress in the future. To honor this milestone, the Women's Bureau launched Our Purpose, Your Work interactive campaign. The Our Purpose, Your Work campaign presents women of all ages with the opportunity to share their work, with their work stories, touch on future aspirations of young women entering the workforce, and talk about how the Women's Bureau has helped advance their purpose. We will be collecting and sharing stories throughout the year and to learn how the Women's Bureau has impacted your life, your work, and your family. We want to hear your story. To participate in this campaign and learn more about the Women's Bureau Centennial, please visit WB100 website at www.dol.gov slash WB100. Join us this year as we reflect on and celebrate the past and set the agenda for the next centennial. Which brings us to today's event.
Today, we are commemorating African American History Month while shining a light on the contributions of women of color in positions of distinguished military service and identifying challenges and opportunities for women in the military. The military remains a non-traditional occupation for women. This means that women account for less than 25% of all persons employed in the military. Women veterans are just 1.5% of the overall women population and 2.2% of the overall black women population. In other words, one in 69 women is a veteran and one in 46 black women is a veteran. These facts highlight that women veterans remain a small yet integral component of our population. It is events such as this that gives us the opportunity to bring veterans and non-veterans, military and non-military civilians together to discuss the achievements, challenges, and opportunities of our women in service. And we thank all of you who served and are serving to protect the freedoms of our country. The distinguished group of women we have here today have faced barriers, defied odds, and risen through the ranks into leadership position in the military. They have blazed their own trails in the armed forces and created opportunities for women to follow in their footsteps. We are honored to host Dr. Beth Betty Mosley Brown, Major General Irene Trowell Harris, Command Master Chief Octavia Harris, and Command Sergeant Major Michelle Jones for this roundtable discussion. Today we celebrate their achievements and thank them for their bravery and service to our country. But before we get started with our panelists and moderator to the, uh, and bring them to the stage, I'd like to introduce you to Cecilia Hill from the Veterans Employment and Training Service, who will be representing vets. Cecilia. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Cecilia Hill. I'm a proud black woman and Marine Corps veteran. I'm with the Department of Labor Veteran Employment Training Service where I support the Transition Assistance Program that serves nearly 200,000 service members every year. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my story. I'm also honored to be in the company of very prestigious women. Uh, this is a proud moment for me personally and for my family. Simply put, my story is one of pers uh, perseverance on the part of my mother who had the fortitude to want a better life for her children. My mother went on to raise four responsible and successful children. She was, thir uh, my mother was 13 years old and a single mother who had four children by the time she was 19. Despite my mother's age, she set a high standard of living for us at an early age, even though we were poor. My mother insisted that we had to be cleaned and well-groomed early every morning, just in case she had to run errands and didn't want, us, didn't want her children looking a mess. An example I try to follow to this day. When I was six years old, my mother signed my sister and brothers and I um, up for a program in Cleveland, Ohio called Friendly Town, which was a program designed to allow poor children, inner city black children, to spend a week in the summer at an upper middle income white family's home in order to give us the experience of life outside of the ghetto. It turns out that I was the only child in our family that actually loved the entire experience of Friendly Town and spent every summer with my surrogate family until I was 18 years old. I had never really been the only child at my mother's home and I learned at an early age that there were special advantages to being an only child. <laughs> My surrogate mother and father are named Jimmy and Carol Meyer. Jimmy is the wife and retired libra librarian, and Carol is the husband and Presbyterian minister. Jimmy and Carol taught me things that I may have never seen living in the projects of Cleveland, Ohio, like playing chopsticks on the piano, um, what a pendulum was, um, and how to count change when paying for cash for items at the grocery store. I referred to Jimmy and Carol as mom and dad. I remember one time we were at the grocery store and I yelled, mom, can I buy this? 
and everyone near us started looking around for a black woman. Um, because I certainly couldn't have been speaking to anyone else in the store. Jimmy simply turned around and answered, only if you can tell me how much change you get back after you pay for it. I wish you could have seen the faces um, on the people that witnessed our exchange. <laughs> I also had the experience of playing with the white children in Jimmy and Carol's neighborhood, neighborhood, which didn't start out so well. But Jimmy insisted that I try again to make new friends. And even though my feelings were hurt because when I first went out, uh, no one really wanted to play with me. Uh, after a while, um, they asked if they could touch my skin and touch my hair, which in exchange I said, if I can touch your skin and hair. And uh, after we got through that, we just forgot about the differences that we all had and went on to become great friends. Um, this experience helped me realize that we're not so different after all and that kindness is colorblind. I went on to spend a great summer with my surrogate family and friends every year after that time. The lifelong experiences I had with Jimmy and Carol are a benefit to me even today. And I'll forever be in the graces for taking in a little black girl that just wanted to see the, what the world was like outside the ghetto, and to my mother who provided me the opportunity to participate in Friendly Town. It's definitely changed my life. I've been an avid athlete most of my life, and even to this day play adult women's softball for a 50 and over team, um, which travels and locally in Fairfax County. When I was in high school, I was a letter player on the basketball, volleyball, and track teams. During my senior year, I learned that I had received a partial scholarship to Tennessee A&M University, which I was very excited about. But when I told my mother about the awesome opportunity, she stated that she knew that my schooling would be paid for, but she didn't know how I would eat, that she couldn't afford to feed me while I was there. Not wanting to cause my mother any more hardship than she was already suffering with raising four children, I joined the U.S. Marine Corps after visiting a friend who was speaking to a recruiter in her home. I became very intrigued hearing about the Marine Corps, and Charlene and I joined the Marine Corps buddy system in 1980 and together departed for the Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island. That decision changed our lives forever. Even though shortly after boot camp, we realized that the truth was told to us naively. By the way, boot camp was no summer vacation. <laughs> But we both graduated on time and went on to have a great career. The Marine Corps has proven to be a staple in all of my employment opportunities throughout my adult life. And I'm forever grateful, not to mention the pride I feel when someone realizes that I'm a veteran who served in such a prestigious organization. As a black woman Marine, I was certainly one of the fewer and one of the prouder. I hope my story helps someone to realize what tremendous opportunities await them when considering joining military service. And when the time comes for them to transition from military to civilian life, I hope that the opportunities that were available to me will be even more abundant to those that come afterwards. I'll always do my part to help in any way possible to make life a little easier for the next transitioning service member. I'm proud to be a black woman and U.S. Marine Corps veteran, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Cecilia. What a powerful story and testimony. Thank you for sharing with us. And now I invite the panelists to come forward. Dr. Mosley Brown, Command Sergeant Major Jones, Dr. Troll Harris, Command Master Chief Harris. And I will turn it over to Dr. Mosley Brown. Thank you. <laughs> the microphone, oh, I hear it, so, yes. So you weren't the only one at Paris, Paris Island, South Carolina. Yes. <laughs> so welcome to a conversation with military leaders on blazing trails in the armed forces. It is truly an honor to be here and to be the moderator for this conversation. What I'd like you to know is that we are all friends. Right. So over the years and our service in uh, public service, we have found the connection. So I'm just honored to be here with them. 
We'd like to share a little bit about our story. So we have about two minutes, and I'm going to start so that they can see how it's done, because <laughs> we have to keep on time. <laughs> and first, I want to thank uh, Department of Labor. Thank you for having this program. So in 1978, a little girl who was the daughter of uh, Army WAC, Women Army Auxiliary Army, Army Corps. Corps. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> my mother was Army oh. and my dad was Air Force. I decided I was going to do something different because I knew everything at the age of 18. <laughs> so I went down to the recruiters and at that time I actually thought that I was just joining the Army because all the services were the Army. But little did I know that Gunnery Sergeant Parks in full dress blues would be right up front and I would end up in Paris. Paris Island, South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> so life has been wonderful and I've had a wonderful career with the Center for Women Veterans. I've served as the president of the Women Marines Association for six years and now it's just an honor to be here with you. So next I'm going to share, let Command Sergeant Command Master Chief, I wanted to call her Sergeant Major, but Command Master Chief Octavia Harris, tell a little bit about her career. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for that gracious past introduction. Thank you. I'm Octavia Harris, as uh, Dr. Betty just mentioned, and um, it's an honor to be here. It truly is, and I appreciate sharing the stage, which I feel like these are trailblazers. I'm just along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> I, joined, I joined the Navy, and when I joined, I was a junior in high school. And uh, that's during a time when they were given the ASVAB test to high schoolers. So I took the test, and I didn't think that much of it. And about a month later, I got a phone call from a Navy recruiter who said, you know, um, Octavia, you did really well on your ASVAB. You know, we'd like to talk to you about joining the Navy. And I'm thinking to myself, the Navy? I don't even know how to swim. <laughs> the Navy? <laughs> so, you know, the recruiter was persistent and talked to me about the Navy a lot. And I think his passion for the Navy is what convinced me that I could be there. So I had a long talk with my mom because she had to sign for me as a junior in high school. And I told her, I said, this is, you know, his passion sold me on it. And so she signed for me and for the next year, finishing up high school, I learned how to swim at the YMCA mm -hmm. and off I went to boot camp. And then 30 years later, I retired from the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> And so I feel like I had a, a great naval career. And, um, you know, from there, when I retired, I went into civil service. I was a program manager for a very special program at Naval, um, naval Medical Center San Diego. Um, it's called the CARE program, Comprehensive Advanced Restorative Effort. And what it is, it's a program that treats the most traumatically injured men and women of all services that had the the most traumatic injuries and illnesses. And what we did was instead of having them have all these different appointments for all these different specialists, we'd have the specialist come to our clinic and the patient come and the specialist would come see them. So they didn't have multiple appointments and had to see multiple positions and it worked out really well. So from that, I ended up moving to San Antonio and I decided, you know, I like San Antonio, so I think I'll move here. Sold my house in California, moved to San Antonio. In Texas, you don't have to work that much, <laughs> unlike California. <laughs> so then I decided to become a professional volunteer, was selected to be on the um, Secretary VA, uh, VA Committee of um, Women Veterans, and just last year selected as the chair. So I'm honored. Thank you. So I'm honored to be here, and I didn't know uh, the woman that makes life easy for me and the committee would be here, but the executive director, Jackie Hayes-Bird, is here, the Center for Women Veterans. 
Thank you. So Command Sergeant Major Michelle Jones. <laughs> Well, hello, good morning to everybody. I think it's still morning. Um, it is truly a blessing to be here. That's what I say in my world. And hey, Jackie, how you doing? Um, and, and Kathy, oh, sorry, shout outs, I had to do it. Um, anyway, one thing, it is an honor to sit up here on this panel. Uh, the, the, the irony is we got Marines, we got Navy, we got Army, whoa, and then we have Air Force, you know. So I had to say that, but um, long story short, uh, I graduated from high school at 16. My parents said you're going to college, did not defy my parents. However, when I turned 18, I said, I want to go in the Army. I saw the commercial back then. The, the uh, campaign was be all you can be, OK? And I, I wanted to be all I could be, and on my own. Um, I told my parents that I would finish college, my time, my dime. And it was really the commercial uh, for me that did it. Uh, it was commercial some of you may remember. Uh, it was a uh, guy coming out of a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> and he landed in the woods and he said, good morning, first sergeant. And I was like, I want to do that and I want to meet him. You know, I always tell a story. So I did that. I didn't meet him, but that's OK. Um, my military career was, was fantastic. The bottom line is I had the best teams. I did not plan to stay for more than three years, did 25. And um, again, the best thing, and I, I have to say this last piece, and I'm passing on because I know there's more questions, is this. My last assignment, my last assignment, I was the ninth command sergeant major of the entire Army Reserve, responsible for about, I don't know, 600, 800, 1.2 million soldiers and family members. The, you were one of my babies. You know, one of my babies. Sorry, I digress. But the, the, <laughs> what happened, my staff, my team, I inherited the previous sergeant major's team. But as they got promoted, I said, you got to go to grow. I continued to fill my team. And it was all nominative. And when it was all said and done, and I looked around, my entire team were all women. All women. It was not by design. It was because they brought the best, what I needed, what the Army needed, particularly the Army Reserve at that time. And to stand there, to be at the top of my game, to have the best team, and that they were all women was something I could never have imagined coming in in 1982. So with that. Thank you, Michelle. So Dr. Trow Harris is one of the most humble people you will ever meet. But what you need to know is she's a retired two-star general who I say ma'am to. So Dr. Trow Harris. Good morning. Well, I grew up on a small cotton farm in Aiken, South Carolina. One day, I saw a jet plane flying over the cotton field. And I said to my 10 brothers and sisters, one day, I'm going to be up there teaching and working on an airplane. Would you believe that did happen? So my career has been defined by leadership, collaboration, and mentoring. In spite of all the challenges and the roadblocks, I joined the military in 1963. I became a senior flight nurse, two stars. Uh, I, I earned a doctorate degree, wrote two books, chapters and two others, became a senior service executive at the Department of Veterans Affairs, and a White House appointee serving two presidents. Thank you all. So now I'd like each of you to answer this question. What was your motivation for really joining the armed forces? And Dr. Trow Harris, you gave a little bit, but can you just give a little more as to why you joined? Well, I had two uncles in World War II, but I really didn't understand the military. But for some reason, I wanted to become a flight nurse. And I can't tell you why that happened, except that word I made in the cotton field that day. But I really wanted to serve my country, just like my, my uncles. And back in 1963, you can imagine, that was fairly complex. And I graduated from flight school in 1964. But I was determined, regardless of the barriers, to be successful. 
not just to be successful, but to motivate other people, including my brothers and sisters, to also join the military. And I had one brother who became a flight surgeon. He served in the Air Force. And another brother became a pilot. So again, it's all about accomplishing something, but sharing and mentoring others to become successful. It's hard for me to say first names, but can I Michelle, call, can I call Michelle, you Michelle? Please. Michelle, exactly. commands our major. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I, that was the, the what I spoke on in regards of the parachutist, a uh, paratrooper. But what uh, drove me to the Army in particular is that I, I really did march to a different drummer. And when I joined in 1982, they had just disbanded the Women's Army Corps. And so with that being said, I had not a clue, truly, uh, what the experience was going to be other than it was going to be different from my peers. And so, as I said before, I only planned on staying for three years. I went in as a paralegal because I thought I wanted to become an attorney. But I found out very quickly that that's not what I wanted to do. But what I found in the Army was, a, was an opportunity to really push myself and challenge myself. And as I continued to grow as a leader, then I realized that it's not about it's not about you. It's about what you can do for someone else. When young people started coming in that didn't have the type of background that I had, I was very blessed. I had both sets of parents. Both, both, both my parents were college graduates, both sets of grandparents. And that I could give them something not just professionally, but personally to be that mentor, to be that coach, to be that mama when they needed it to push him in the forehead and tell him you're jacked up, but I'm going, I'm going to show you, and I'm going to teach you, and I'm going to hold your hand, and I'm going to push you in the back to help you along the way. You are going to leave me better than when you got here. So that's what, what kept me there, and, and I saw that evolution of self. And then the last piece I'll add is when you go to another country and you are the first African-American woman, that, or African-American, period, that they've ever seen, you realize that now you become an ambassador for women and that you have an opportunity to profoundly affect someone's lives. I went into civil affairs in, in the special operations arena, and so it was everywhere. And to be able to help and to build and to touch people that I never in a million years would have been able to do. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Command Master Chief. Oh, I can call you Tay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Tay. Yeah, my permission. <laughs> well, I think what um, made me even think about the military was I, I have three older brothers, and they each served um, one tour in the Air Force and Air National Guard. And I thought about military service because um, of their example. However, I, I didn't think about the Navy until I got that call from the recruiter. And, you know, like I said, his passion kind of persuaded me. Mm. And I thought, you know, it's, it's kind of a cliche, but I wanted to be a part of something bigger than myself. You know, I was, I was kind of a nerdy um, loner in high school. I wasn't into cliques or anything like that. So I really wanted to be in a place where I can contribute to a lot more people that have the same thing in common. And that same thing in common was the mission. And I truly believe that. And everywhere I went, that's what I, I thought about. Wow, everybody in this organization, even though we have different jobs, we're all here for the same reason. Whether it is to fight the ship, or when I was in the aviation squadron to make sure those planes are up, or if I was on shore duty to make sure everything got done administratively correct. I wanted to be a part of something that was going to succeed and I had a part in it. And I had a part in helping my fellow sailor, helping my commanding officer look good, mm -hmm. and, and bringing those up the rear behind me. Mm -hmm. And so like Michelle said, that's important, mm -hmm. you know, to p push that person forward. And I think that's why I joined. I wanted to be part of something mm -hmm. bigger and special and say, hey, I'm part of that team. Thank you. 
So as a Marine, I wish I could say that it was that simple. But my mother, had, my Army mother gave me three choices. She said, one, you can get married when you're 18. But I don't know how that could happen, because I couldn't date. She wouldn't let me date. <laughs> She said, you can go to college, but someone else has to pay. And then she said, or you can join the military. And so it was that easy. At 17, I went down, and she was glad to sign me over. So <laughs> it went that way. So Dr. Trow Harris, I have a question for you. What was it like when you joined the military in 1963 and graduated from flight nurses school in 64? And that time period was prior to the passage of most of the civil rights legislation. So what was it like? I must say it was quite challenging because uh, at basic orientation when I first joined, there were only like four people out of 40 that were African-American or uh, other minorities. And when I got the flight school in 1964, 40 people, there were two minorities. And during that time, uh, that they were reluctant to send minorities to flight school because they thought they were afraid and they couldn't, 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 couldn't do it. But I was determined. When I knew I was going to go to flight school, I looked up the criteria. At the library at that time, we didn't have the computers. <laughs> <laughs> and I checked every requirement to uh, uh, succeed in flight school. Things included learning everything I knew as a nurse, adjusting that to differential oxygen pressure after you reached 10,000 feet. Also, about I needed to do things that you didn't do historically on the ground as a nurse. For example, doing chest taps and also cry thyroid otomies in case of emergencies with breathing and intestinal problems. So I practiced, I read books, I talked to people, and again, I was not the best swimmer. I went and took an advanced course in swimming, which you <laughs> had to be able to save your patients if you have a crash in the water or on land, so I had to go to, but anyway, I made sure I knew the criteria, I practiced, I studied, so by the time I got to flight school, we all were very dedicated. It's a very challenging uh, type of pro program, but we end up studying in groups. And I was one of these, I was one of the honor students, so everybody went to join my group. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But I must say, I uh, graduated and became a flight nurse instructor immediately, and very soon became a flight nurse examiner as a check ride for nurses internationally. Thank you. So, Tay, only about 1% of the U.S. military is promoted to E-9 rank, and less than that are women. Having been promoted to Command Master Chief, can you give us a sense of what it was like not only being one of the few women of that rank, but one of the few African-American women at this rank in the Navy? Well, I certainly stood out. <laughs> 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 yeah, definitely. <laughs> but, but seriously, um, well, you know, it was always a two-sided two coin for me. On one side, you know, I had mentors, male and female, because I always say, you know, there were times where, you know, everyone in my chain of command was male. So I had good experiences there. Then on the flip side, you know, when I was one of the first females after the uh, combat exclusion law was lifted, I was one of the first females to embark USS Nimitz, an aircraft carrier. And when me and the other 10 women out of a 2,000 crew ship walked on board, we were taunted, we were booed, we were harassed, you name it. And because they didn't want us there, the guys didn't want us there, they didn't think we would pull our weight, they couldn't walk around in their skivvies or underwear anymore and watch porn out in the open, whatever. <laughs> they didn't have to shower, they could walk around stinky or whatever. <laughs> they didn't want us there. So get used to it, guys. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> We're only gonna multiply, which, we, which we've done. So, you know, on, on that side of it, you know, when, I, when you go up in the ranks, um, you see less and less women, less and less minorities. And, you know, some folks would say, eh, she got there because of a quota. And see, that's a myth. There are no quotas on selections. That's the one thing that we have in the military 
unlike corporate America, I think. You know, I sat selection boards. And when we look at evaluations, we don't know the, the ethnicity, the race. We don't know where they come from. And the only reason why we know the gender is because of the pronouns that are used in the write-up. That's the only way we know that. We don't track it. So I always get a little perturbed when people say that. No, I worked for what, you know, what I had achieved. I rolled up my sleeves and I did the work, sometimes better than my male counterparts. And, and so, you know, so there was a bit of a struggle. I had um, a good friend of mine gave me a perfect analogy, you know, because you have to work twice as hard. Everybody's watching your every move because you stand out and, you know, waiting for you to not fail, but certainly not succeed. And she gave me an analogy. She goes, you know, Tay, you have to be not Avis or budget, but you have to be Hertz or Enterprise, <laughs> period. So just keep that in mind because, you know, everybody's going to be watching you. And you're also going to be an example to those junior minority women because they, some of them never seen a black female, you know, that, that high in the ranks. And um, so... You know, you put out there in the spotlight. And uh, for those naysayers and those folks that say, well, she just got here because of X, Y, or Z quota, you know, a, a, a phrase from my favorite first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. Mm -hmm. So that was ignored, but that happened. Those were some of the challenges of um, making making Command Master Chief. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And Michelle, you were the first woman to serve as Division Command Sergeant Major, and prior to your retirement, you held that highest non-commissioned officer position of any woman in the Army. What was it like for you to be that first, and what helped you to get there? Well. I will say the first time I was a first, I didn't even realize it. In most, in most cases, you don't really realize you're the first. You just, you do what you do. Um, and so when someone said to me, you know, you're the first, and my comment was, I'm not going to be the last either. Um, so so was, I was adamant about that. Um, being a division command sergeant major, and for those that aren't familiar with the Army, you know, every military service has their size element. Uh, division is one of the largest sizers, um, and they had never had a woman. But again, I really didn't look at it. It was like, okay, great, let's move on, let's move forward. What do we have to do? It was really when I became the, the sergeant major of the Army Reserve, because it was during the time the global war on terrorism. It, it, was, it was the most contentious time in the military's history, period. Um, we've got deploying tens of thousands of reserve members that are deploying, called up, National Guard, all the services. And the same thing was said to me, you know, was, well, they had to pick a woman. N wrong answer. Mm -hmm. They had to pick the right person at the right time during the most contentious time. So when I, I look at being the first, it is a blessing. What it really has done has given me a platform. It has opened up some doors so I can tell our story. It has opened up the doors. It has put the microphone in front of me so I can pull other women in. It has opened up the door for me to elevate women veterans, period. So our stories can continue to be told. It has put me in a place and a space to make sure that not only are we not forgotten, not only is our service not mitigated, not only is it that we are, we're not just a sidebar, but we are indeed the military. We are indeed veterans. So being the first actually allows me to have the dialogue and bring other women veterans in so they can have the dialogue too. We have to be a force together. So that's the bottom line. That's what being first really, really means to me. Thank you. 
So Dr. Trow Harris, I have a question for you. In 1986, you were appointed clinic commander of the New York Air National Guard, 105th U.S. Air Force Clinic, Newburgh, New York, becoming the first nurse, female, and African-American in National Guard history to command a medical clinic. You managed a staff of 92 healthcare professionals and 1,800 beneficiaries support of the C- 5A jumbo jet worldwide flying mission. <laughs> what was that experience like? And did you have any challenges? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> First thing, uh, it was a shock because prior to then, uh, there were nurses were not allowed or other professionals to command a clinic like that. It was a physician, flight surgeon, and non Caucasian. The law had been changed a couple years prior to that, but no one, you know, bothered. So when my, uh, my commander at the clinic uh, retired, uh, we start helping the base commander look for a new commander for the clinic. So I, of course, I nominated two people I thought would be very good to be the commander, and they put a worldwide, a, a, a statewide search out. So one day, my base commander called me and said, I'm just calling to let you know who I selected, because, you know, you, you need to meet this person. So I said, well, who did you select? He said, you. I said, wait a minute. That couldn't be right. So he said, Yes, I looked at all the applications and our C5A mission. We have 12 jumbo jets we got to keep in the sky. And Anissa somebody is going to push the policy, follow the rules, and make people do what they need to do. So as a commander, I was responsible for all the things that you mentioned. But the biggest challenges were getting people to flight nurse school or, or to doctors to their school. When anyone coming in the National Guard, they're not necessarily trained and educated. You have to get training slots for them. Anyone on flying status need the chamber slots. So there were a lot of staff issues there that I was very, very, very concerned about. But what I did initially is look at, to, to find out what the real issues were in the unit, I pull out the five past inspection reports and look at the deficiencies there. So what I began to do is to recruit cardiologists, flight surgeons, nurses, and others who could help me run that clinic. So basically, with the uh, staff recruited, uh, I was able to raise the inspection rate initially from like a, a satisfactory to an excellent. But the challenge was really making sure people met the, re met the requirements. Flying physicals, chamber rise, you know, ongoing education, and that everybody was, it was part of a team. I, I found out that really if you respect people, talk to people, help them, they're going to make sure that the mission is successful. Like you said, being the first, I didn't have anybody to really go to, but I went to everybody that I could, because <laughs> I wanted that unit to be the best of all, all the units. And in the end, what the military did, based on my experience, they started appointing nurses and others as commanders all around this country, eventually to assistant adjutant general, female minorities, and and also to adjutant general. So in the National Guard, that is the highest position you, you can obtain. So again, the outcome of my work, my mentoring, and people helping me, that opened their eyes at the, of the leaders, and they made some great decisions for all, all of us. And again, like you said, I want to make sure the young people knew, regardless of your humble beginnings, you can be successful far beyond what you might have expected. Thank you, Dr. Trow Harris. I just, I just wanted to add one thing um, for all of us, because we were the first in, in some capacity. I have to, and I have to give credit where credit is due. Um, I know in my case, and it's typically in those positions were white males, and there are and there were, and there still are, males that believe, and trust me and believe, they, they took some hits yeah. by, by virtue of probably selecting all of us. You know, so, so there are people out there that will step out, and I, I have to say that so people understand that when you get that mentor, it may not look like you, yes, yes. but someone will take a, a, for lack of a better term, a chance yeah. on you, and, and yeah. our selectees, took a chance on us. They believed in us based on what we did, what we were doing, and what they thought we could do. So I, I just had to say that. Thank I had to say you. That. And you're absolutely right. 
So it was mentioned that the director of the Center for Women Veterans, Jack, Jackie Hayes Bird, was here. But I have to say that there was a two-star Air Force general who took a chance on a little private Marine <laughs> to be her associate director with the Center for Women. So uh, talk about chances. It's not only when we're in uniform, but also we have to look for the best and give back right. once we hang up the uniform. So thank you, Dr. Trow Harris. <laughs> so if all of you could say in about one or two sentences, what are the biggest challenges women veterans and women in the service are still facing today? Uh, Octavia, Command Master Chief. Women in the service? Yes, and yeah. women veterans today, both. Okay. I think one of the challenges, I'm gonna start women veterans first. Um, Self-identifying as veterans, that's still an issue for women veterans um, of all eras. And that's been one of the things that um, I think the Center for Women Veterans and her staff have been diligently trying to make an impact on and you're making that impact. And uh, that's one of the things we see on site visits. We go out and we hear women that don't really realize what their benefits are or that they're veterans. So, so that's what you know, I think one of the biggest challenges are for women veterans and, and understanding that the VA is theirs too. And, you know, for active duty women in the military, you know, all the, all the positions, all the fields are open now. All the fields are open. And some of the challenges I think they, women still face is, you know, sexual assaults are high in the military. And, you know, am I gonna go into this field and have a challenge to the point where I'm faced with that, you know, um, issue. Am I going to be given the same opportunity as my male counterpart, even though it's it's open to me now? You know, I felt that way when I first stepped on board that um, aircraft carrier. You know, am I going to be given that opportunity truly? And so I think, you know, for women in uniform, that is still something that is a little bit of a challenge for them. Yes. Michelle? had to think about that. I, I definitely agree. Um, I would say one thing that, first of all, I'll, I'll take women in the service, they don't see themselves as being a veteran one day. Everybody's going to be a veteran. You're in, you're going to get out one day, be it three years or 33 years. So that's number one. The second thing, the connectivity of women veterans to women in the military. Um, I don't know of any major events, activities, conferences or whatever, forums where you have women veterans that are actually going to uh, talk to service mem women that are still in. That could be number one, mentors, guides, help them through those processes um, and also to help them navigate the world into this veteran in space. So I would say that's that's kind of like the short answer um, and, and some of that because we still don't always say we're veterans either as agreed. Absolutely. So that's a short answer. And Dr. Trow Harris, I know you were involved with the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Service who talks about that. So what have you seen? Well, I think uh, with women in the military, I agree with some of the things people have said before, but I, I think um, I'm not sure we get the uh, exact respect we should all the time by other expertise, of course. But um, I worked on the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Service, DACOWITS, to help them look at all of the issues involving women, assignments, policy, et cetera, though. So that's a fabulous committee to work with, and we've made lots of strides uh, with that. But I think, as she mentioned also, that uh, sexual assault is still the issue in, in the military. And at, once in a while, uh, I hear people People talk about the promotion opportunities that they have. So those things are improving and the committees have made a great you know, uh, step in improving that. I think for the veterans these days, we have to be concerned about the issue of homelessness.
wellness, uh, about that mental health. And one of the other issues is, the question is, how can we really educate the women veterans and their families and others nationally? Women sometimes don't really understand exactly what their, their benefits are. They may read the material, they may know people, but they still don't really understand and take advantage of those particular uh, things. But I know the Senate is doing a great job with that. I've been in several of their conferences recently, and they're doing an awesome job, and keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I just want to add, I'm always wanting to add one more thing. <laughs> um, the, and I have to say, the, the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Service that uh, General, um, I say Irene I now. <laughs> Um, spoke about. I'm, vi I'm actually vice chair of that committee, and just to give you um, a quick uh, stat of the 11, approximately 1,100 recommendations that Dakowitz have made pertaining to women in the service, 99% have either been fully or partially implemented over the years. So um, that is one of the committees. Yeah. That is, that is doing doing a lot for women in the service. But I, I just had to add, being vice chair, I'd, I'd be yelled at if I didn't say that. Absolutely. <laughs> so as a Marine, I think back on in the early 80s when Department of Labor and VA really started those transition assistant program classes, the TAP classes. Right. And I, that transition is so important for all of us because we're used to being rank conscious. You know, we're used to looking at calls to see what rank people are. And then when you transition into the civilian world, you need help. So I think it's this agency along with VA that right. have really been on the forefront of making sure that all veterans really understand that and especially women veterans. Tay? I just wanted to add that something that is new, it was an approved pilot, um, Jackie, correct me if I'm wrong, but the VA and DOD have just um, completed a pilot program program through the Air Force to add an extra day um, into um, TAP class specifically for women so they get to learn about their benefits and so to help them identify as veterans. So that's due to roll out, I believe, this year. So that's a start. And you may say, well, why is that so important? Because I remember years ago when women who had gender-specific health concerns in the military didn't realize that that could be a service-connected disability, concerns with our breasts or as a, a hysterectomy or things that we normally don't talk about in public forums, but it may be service-connected. So we can't be invisible anymore, ladies. We must speak out and we must share the information. Absolutely. So thank you. All right, we're going to talk about leadership now. And we're going to start with you, Army so Command Sergeant Major. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your leadership philosophy and how it applies to the issues affecting women veterans today? Okay. Um, well, my leadership philosophy, it's remained the same. Uh, it's called the Bones Theory, and it's four bones. Uh, First bone, backbone, having the courage to stand up and be who you are, having the courage to step outside of what is the norm, having the backbone or the courage to say the things that most people won't say, and having the courage or the backbone to go against the tide when the tide is going the wrong way. The second bone, wishbone, believing and hoping and knowing it's possible. If you don't think it can happen, it will not. Uh, the third bone is Are the you all writing this down? I this is important. <laughs> This is important. Go to that third bone. The third bone is the funny bone. Instead of getting mad, instead of get, trying to get even, instead of being vengeful, laugh, let it go, come back, take another avenue of approach, go over it, under it, kick it out the way, giggle your way to success. And whatever that looks like for you. And then the last bone is nothing. And I mean absolutely nothing happens if you don't get off your tailbone and make it happen. You can talk about it all day. So that's my life philosophy as well as my leadership philosophy and, and how it translates today is quite simple. As I mentioned, you know, the, being the first, it opens the doors for you. So 
quick snapshot number one sitting on Dakowitz when I got the invitation to come as a member I said I'm going to do it so I've been a, me a member subcommittee lead vice chair um, to help to make those changes with a team of wonderful people the second thing is I sit on a board um, it's called the history makers it's a, a nonprofit 5013c all the oral history is stored in the Library of Congress I am on a mission I have been tasked by the organization to have women veterans stories told. So that's number two. I've been invited to sit on another one, but I can't say yet because I haven't been accepted yet. So, but again, um, being a voice. The fourth, fourth thing is entertainment. Entertainment. The reason a lot of times that women's stories aren't shown or told or women don't talk, because we don't see it on TV. We don't see it in the movies. We don't see it in Netflix. We don't see it in those places. So partnership going with the um, Academy Awards as well as with some of the uh, more popular theaters around the country to actually showcase the experiences of women veterans. So those are just some of the things taking that leadership. People have told me no. People have told me that it can't be done, it won't be done, and all those things. I laugh, let it go, kick it to the curb. I'm going to keep it moving. <laughs> you know, part of that GSD club, get stuff done. And you can take that S and say whatever you want. Yeah. Um, I'm from Baltimore, and I'll leave it alone. So Thank that's you. what it does. But I love what you said about the bones. Right. Thank you. <laughs> and so if you have ever served in the military, regular or reserve, and you're a female, our bones, yes. our birthplace is the Women's Memorial. And mm -hmm. I see in the audience the president yes. of the Women's yes. Memorial, yes. Phyllis Wilson. So... <laughs> so her task is to make sure that the almost two million living women veterans are in the database at the Women's Memorial and those that have passed away that we then enter their stories in so our stories never become his story, but her story. So thank you, ma'am. And if you're not a part of the Women's Memorial, please make sure that you do. So we're going to wrap this up a little before we take some Q&A, but I think what's important is what resources, if you were to give a couple resources that our women veterans uh, need to know, Dr. Trahares, what is, are some resources that they should know that they may not readily hear about? Well, I want the first thing I would like to mention is the Federal Benefits Book Bulletin, which Your includes microphone. information for Okay. She's a two-star general and feels that she can be heard. So there you go, Dr. Trout. We hear you. We hear you. Uh, the first recommendation I would make is the uh, federal benefits uh, book, which uh, is for veterans, dependents, and survivors. But every medical center, clinic, uh, benefits are in that book. And it's online. The 2019 version is online. Um, the second thing is the 25 frequently asked questions by women veterans was the initial one, but it's the Center for Women Veterans frequently asked questions. Every possible question a female may have is in that book because you gave us the questions to put in that book. So it's very important. And I would uh, check the website, not just the VA website, but the Center for Women Veterans, the Center for Minority Veterans, the uh, all this, that's the, it's fabulous. It tells you exactly what's available, how to get their benefits, places to go, and again, those are very important resources uh, that would be very beneficial to you and your family. And when you're out there, talk to people. When you find veterans out there having issues, talk to them, talk to them, help them find the resource they need, like the people in the audience, audience today. Sometimes they're not aware of the benefits. They don't know how to go about doing it. Some of them may have medical issues that they may not be able to do it. So again, share those resources and help other veterans, men and women. Thank you, Michelle. I would say, um, besides everything that um, Irene said as well, um, the one thing that I would say, and you touched on a little bit uh, regarding homeless women veterans, um, that, that is very real. And one of the organizations that I work with, it's a nonprofit, it's Final Salute Inc. Uh, not only do they provide transitional housing for homeless women veterans with children. The second I would say is check the DC mayor's uh, website as well. There's often, especially if you're in the area 
area. Uh, D.C., the mayor's office has so many events specific to women veterans. Um, there are links back to both the VA, to Department of Labor, but also different uh, entities that attend those events. And besides giving information, um, assistance, uh, all kinds of things. And then the best part is the sisterly bond that happens there that someone can help you that may not even have a booth, if you will, or a table. But look at those avenues as well. All right, and Tay? And just to culminate everything they said, I would um, you know, encourage women veterans to you know, seek out their woman veteran program manager mm -hmm. at whatever respective VA they're at, mm -hmm. because they're there. Mm -hmm. You know, at all 150 VA medical centers, there's a woman veteran program manager, and her job is specifically to help women veterans navigate through the VA healthcare system. And there's also, um, in VBA, women care coordinators mm -hmm. to do the same thing on the benefit side. So I think that's a great start. Women veterans, many don't realize that resource is there. And I think that's important. I would also want women veterans to know, since I, since Phyllis is here, our president, mm -hmm. I'm a, a WEMSA ambassador for Texas. I would encourage them, if they're not registered, to register. Because that is the only national monument that we have. That's right. And we need to keep it strong and going. So I would have two or three messages for women veterans. <laughs> so. And I just have to say, Department of Labor was the tool, the resource that got me my very first job once I hung up my uniform. So I am forever indebted. They said, go see the DVOP. I was like, what's a DVOP? <laughs> you know? But, but they said, well, aren't you a veteran? And would you like to learn about benefits? And before I knew it, that's how I got my foot into the VA door back in 1900. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we still have some time. So what would you like non-veterans to know about us? Tay, you start. Okay. Um, I would like non-veterans to know that women didn't start serving two weeks ago. Yeah. Women have been serving um, since the Revolutionary War. And, you know, starting with, you know, the Deborah Sampsons, you know, disguising themselves as men because they wanted to fight for their country. Kathy Williams, the first black female to serve. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, Michelle, you talked about those Caucasian men that took a chance on us, President Harry Truman, mm -hmm. when he signed into law for us to serve in the regular service. You know, a lot of, a lot of non-veterans, a lot of Americans don't realize that women have served in combat before we could serve in combat. Right, exactly. And so I, I think I would really like non-veterans to know um, the contributions that, you know, women have made um, in support of the armed forces, the guard, the reserve, active duty. And, you know, and serving your country and realize that only one in three Americans has volunteered. All women who have served are volunteers. None of us have been drafted. Um, so I would like, you know, for non-veterans and Americans to realize that because you'd be surprised that they don't. You know, sometimes you see when you walk into a VA, you may get asked, are you here for your husband or your father? No, I'm the veteran. Yeah. I'm the veteran. <laughs> you know, so that's what I would like to drill down to people. Thank you. Michelle? Actually, that, that last piece that you said, um, the difference between a man's service and a woman's service mm -hmm. is that every woman that ever served volunteered, period. That, that is the big thing. And it is totally by choice that we stayed. Yes. That's it. Okay. Dr. Trout. I think, uh, I think one of the first things I would like them to know is that your military service helps you excel professionally and academically. When I joined the military, uh, I didn't have, have the degrees, I didn't have the positions, but by serving the military, I was encouraged to go back and get the doctorate. I was encouraged to start working for VA when I left the service to help veterans, and I immediately got a GS-15 job in the Inspector General's office, and soon after that, I was called by the White House to 
the interview for the Center for Women Veterans. And subsequent to that, I was the VA's representative to the White House on the Council of Women and Girls, working with 29 agencies, working together to solve the problems for women veterans. So they need to know that military service has lots of benefits and that we should be respected. But again, it is a source of education, but people can become professional, and it's a wonderful feeling when you know you're, you're supporting and serving your country for a good reason. Thank you. So when we were asked that question, I was thinking to myself, we all are of a certain decade, pretty much somewhat close in decades, in age, somewhat. <laughs> but what we, you need to realize, if you're a non-veteran, is that we have many World War II women and Vietnam era women who have served that may not ever raise their hands and say that they're a veteran because they think no one's thinking about them. And it wasn't too long ago that I found out that there were non-nurse women who served in country yeah. Vietnam. Yeah. There were hundreds of them. But if you think of a Vietnam veteran, first you think of a male, and then you think of a female nurse. And while we love our nurses, we have to also remember the Vietnam non-nurses that served in country. So I, I, am I getting the hook? <laughs> All right. All right, so I think we're ready for Q&A. So I'm going to stand up for this because I want to be the drum major. That was always what I wanted to do. And so, so I see there are two microphones on the side. So if you have a question for this esteemed panel, please just raise your hand and we'll identify you so that you can ask a question. And, and there's one right there. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Lakia Graham. I'm with the American Job Center, Virginia Employment Commission. I am a Veterans Employment Representative, a DVOP. Yes. So my question to the panel is, what was your biggest challenge that you faced becoming a transition and service member to a civilian, and how did you overcome it? All right, why don't we start with Dr. Trow Harris and come, go down. Well, when I was getting ready to uh, leave the military, I was encouraged to attend one of the, the briefings. And I think the challenge there was the briefing was good, but it covered very little on women veterans. So what I did, I immediately went back and found out who was in charge, and I contacted that person and said, we need to include the gender specific and all the things related to women veterans. So after that, I went back to another session, and those items were covered. Michelle? Um, I would say, speaking of in employment, um, one of the things, if you look at the stats across private sector, if you look at the males that come, especially let's say senior level males that come out, they get those high level positions. You've got general officers, you've got you know non senior non commissioned officers. If you look at the data that's out there, they're not getting those positions. And so to look at that place and space and realize that corporate America, private sector, is not offering the same types of positions, compensations for women veterans. That was a very, real hard pill to swallow. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the hardest piece for me personally to accept. And Tay? My biggest challenge was figuring out what to wear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the Navy told me what to wear every day every since day. I was 18 years old. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so that was, you know, and, and also, um, I made the mistake of working up to two weeks prior to my retirement ceremony. And I advised people, whether you're getting out at four years or 30 or 40, don't do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't prepare myself for I'm going to be a civilian after 30 years of being in the military. That, that was a big challenge for me. And, you know, affiliating with the VA healthcare system was a little bit of a challenge for me because, again, in the military, you're told where to go, you're told what to do. I mean, they tell you when you have to go to, to the dentist. You know, you're really on your own out there. So one of the challenges for me was segueing from military to being a civilian. 
And so that's one thing that um, I definitely am glad that DOD and VA are going to work together to help service members transition better. And I was the most junior here transitioning. So after my 14 years of active duty, I, I really didn't know where to go. So knowing that there were offices like the Center for Women Veterans, and now there's a Woman Veteran Call Center still. Yeah. And so there are places you can go, as well as that collaboration between federal agencies to make sure that we get in the loop. So it's much better than what it was back in the 1900s. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Right, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, ma'am. Kathy. Uh, Kathy Santos, National Alliance of Women Veterans. Uh, first, let me just thank uh, the Department of Labor for their great work today. It's amazing. Uh, they did a project, Homeless Women Veterans Listening Sessions. I think Dr. Harris will remember that. But I think what's, uh, what is of historical significance here today is the transitioning uh, discussion where we was, what has been recognized through all of the leaders here today. And with Jackie, I think that we are at a great place in our history having transitioned uh, the four previous uh, directors with the Center for Women Veterans. I find that we are today in a great place for, I think, um, what I'm finding in the nonprofit space uh, as a veteran in the community that uh, I can now give them substantive platforms on which they can connect their issues. There are phone numbers that will be answered today. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Harris, I'd just like to congratulate you today because uh, you were one of the ones that, as a nonprofit founder, introduced me to so many of the very important platforms for me to have discussions and to make as many meetings as I can. But on the social network where they, they are not connected to this particular platform, I will definitely communicate uh, as much as possible. But I think today in the 21st century, we were certainly at a place where there's a real Realistic approach to how we are dealing with the post-transitioning veteran experience. And today, I just want to congratulate and thank you all. My question would be, how could you, uh, as in that transition space, uh, communicate through the nonprofit community? What would be some of the specific concerns? I think this would be something that J.K. certainly is on top of, and uh, the, for sure, Dr. Harris. Uh, um, Chief Harris and Dr. Harris and staying on top of these things, but in that space, sometimes, you know, we're, we're dealing with all war errors out there in the community. Uh, my concern and some of my challenges has been to um, focus in on how to how to verify some of these particular information that they're bringing because they're compounded in some areas. I, I just would think that to be something I could get more clarity on that nonprofit space and how you could best communicate some of these specifics to them. I think that would be a question for me. And so while you mentioned the nonprofit space, let's also talk about the military service organizations. So can you tell how we're working and collaborating between like the disabled American veterans, the American legions, the VFWs, and all those veteran service organizations? I need, I, I'm sorry, I need a little clarification on, on question. All right, I think Kathy is saying she's learned over the years from a nonprofit the resources are available, okay. what resources are available. What are we continuing to do to make sure nonprofits know about what resources are available? And I would think that they're very similar to what we're doing with the military service organization arena. So I can say one that they did, uh, the Center for Women Veterans at VA actually brought in uh, veteran service organizations and nonprofits once a month to actually highlight what was being done and what still needed to be done for women, women veterans. So can... Exactly. I was going to say, um, every month, Jackie, you all um, do... Partners breakfast. So that's a really big thing. And you, it's standing room only, plus you have folks on the line, too. So I think that's one good thing, connecting the VA with, um, with nonprofit stakeholders. Do you have any DOD stakeholders on that call? We do. It's, so what um, we're talking about is we've had um, Phil uh, Jackson. You want to get Jackie the mic? The mic Sorry, is she's coming. She's flying, <laughs> she's flying with the mic. All right. So I'll be quick. Um, so we've had a lot of um, questions about the same thing. And um, every month, the Center for Women Veterans has a partner's breakfast. And that includes nonprofit, non-governmental, VSO groups. Um, um, and what we do at the VA with these uh, women, and they happen to be all women, um, but we have them 
interact with women in the VA, like the Ostaboos, anything that's important to their memberships. And that's the Office of Small Businesses. When we um, get out of the military, oftentimes there are women who want to start their own business. We bring those folks to the table to talk to these um, groups so that they can take them back to their, that information back to their members. Now what's happened was that it got became so popular that we had to open up a Vance line so that women um, can call in and find out what's happening in the organization. And it's become statewide. I'm, not, I'm sorry, not statewide, nationally. And so um, it, it's growing every time we speak. And it's by word of mouth. But it gets to the women veterans. And so I think, I hope I answered your question. But the other piece of that, and I'm not trying to steal a show, I promise. All right. I, I told you we've been doing a lot. Um, but um, we travel, we talk to groups such as um, you all here, and what's happening is men in a lot of the VSOs are reaching out to us to find out how they can better serve their women veterans. So it's, it's um, an issue where when we thought a lot of times we're invisible, We've come out, but we're not invisible. There and and uh, across the U.S., we have this campaign called the I Am Not Invisible campaign. And that's picked up uh, to state houses, to community centers, where women veterans have come out and they don't see themselves as veterans. And so we, we're changing the conversation. Okay, you may not think you're a veteran, but did you serve? <laughs> and that changes the conversation. And so more and more of us are coming out and speaking, and most importantly, helping other women veterans who don't see themselves as veterans to get their, good, their services and their benefits. Thank you, ma'am. So there she is right there with oh. the mic. <laughs> Was there another question? Oh, I, yes. I wanted to make a comment first. Um, I served in the military 28 years, most of which were in the United States Army Reserves. And I can tell you, women deserve everything they've gotten. I've trained with them through basic non-commissioned officer school, advanced non-commissioned officer school, military police school. And one highlight of my career was as a drill instructor, I had a totally female platoon. Wow. I was really concerned about that. <laughs> but what I can say with sincerity is they performed outstanding. So we have good women in the military. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So my question is directed to Command Sergeant Major Jones. Um, when I first joined the military, the non-commissioned officers that I remember seeing didn't necessarily have degrees. They had a lot of good experience, and some of them had combat experience. But over the years, it seemed as though more and more enlisted uh, soldiers were earning degrees, and by the time I got out, anyone who would rise to the, who rose to the rank of uh, first sergeant, command sergeant, or command sergeant major, typically had a degree. How important is that now? Have you did you see that change as well? Absolutely, and um, just to make it clear, I did make my parents proud. I did go back to school and graduated with my degree, 3.9 GPA. Yes. Uh, that out there. But yes, it is important, and, and it, it's not, first of all, it's self-improvement. The second thing, professional improvement. The, the third thing is that it, it is difficult to accomplish a degree while you're in the military, yes. okay? And to, that shows a commitment and a tenacity for something else in terms of your professionalism. The other thing that, yes, it continues, and at first it was associate's degree, then it was bachelor's degree, now it's master's degree. You know, I say I won't get a doctorate, I got two honorary doctorate, that's good enough for me um, at this <laughs> point. But it, and, and in terms of what our mission is, and when I say I say our, even though I'm out, we interact internationally so much now, and there's so much information that would enhance any person, especially an NCO, because they're the ones on the ground, okay? They're boots on the ground, as we always say, and they're leading. And the more, the better understanding they have of multiple things, 
not just experience, but the totality of living, formal education and informal education, uh, will, it will not hurt them. So I do see it increasing. Um, people are, are hungry for more knowledge too, so yes. And also think about how education has changed over the last Absolutely. couple decades. Mm -hmm. Who would think about online school and right. getting degrees? Right. Whereas in the military, because you're tr so transient, a lot of times you couldn't go to a brick and mortar uh, right. facility. So a lot has happened. And I just got to say, so in the 1980s, how many of us were beepers? <laughs> okay, there's a few of us Veepers. So Veepers were the old education mm -hmm. program that I think it maxed out at like $3,700. Yeah. That was all they gave us for education. Yeah. But I some got more of us, than that. I'm sorry. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> I got a bonus. So, so I mean, we had to persevere, and we really wanted it. We yeah. could only dream of a day yeah. when there would be a stipend where you could mm. go to Harvard or you could go to a community college, and VA would pay for it. Well, today is that day. Right. And so those of us that are from 1900s, we know what it's like. <laughs> and so yay to now. If you don't use your education, you can give it to a family member. That's right. And it's absolutely wonderful. So it's good. Yes. Good, good morning. I'm Dr. Darling Lee. I'm with uh, OFCCP, the VAP program. And it's ironic because I'm piggybacking off of what you're saying, and I'm seeking guidance. Uh, referencing education and the medical area. Mm -hmm. I'm a reservist, retiree, and proud. And I find that every time I try to apply for something, they see the reserve, they kind of put it in the back seat. So my question is, I'm, I'm applying to law school, I have my doctorate. And so I've had to pay for all of my schooling, still pay. And so I wanted to know, what would you recommend to obtain the funding through the military. Oh, that's a good question. So, oh, I have a second one. Thing. Oh, all right. <laughs> the second one is the same thing with uh, the medical care. And I, there's a stigma with being a reservist when you come in and, you know, I volunteered by Iraq, a whole nine yards. And so there's, there's a stigma that's out there. And what can we do to correct that? And so it's harder to change minds, but uh, maybe some of you could address just the education piece of it, where she could go to get more education, especially in the medical field, and um, just to get, oh, how can people get over the stigma of a reservist? Okay, I, I can't address, I cannot, because I'm not gonna answer something I can't give you an answer to, but what I can tell you about in terms of being a reserve, reserve member, okay, because you're a soldier who happened to have been in the reserves. Yes. Okay, how about that? Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is a bullet IPG, IED knows no component. That's the second thing. Yeah. The third thing is this, the difference between a reserve member's service, okay, you come when you call. Okay, period. You, like she said, you can't change people's mind. You can only walk in your place in space. Dare someone say to me, Michelle Jones, you're just a reservist. I was an active component too. Okay, period. It's your mind too. If you say, well, I was just in the reserves, guess what? They're gonna treat you like you're just in the reserves. Period. I was in the army, I was in the reserve component. Dot, dot, dash, as the kids say. I think they still say that, I don't know. <laughs> you know, that's what you say. You can't change someone's, what that person does, they're trying to mitigate who you are. And if they never served, then you ask them, what service did you serve in? <laughs> How about that? Uh, I do have an attitude about that, mm -hmm. okay? Because being a Sergeant Major of the, of the Army Reserve and the multiple categories of reserve component soldiers active on active duty 24-7, mm -hmm. Traditional reserve, most people don't understand. I'm not gonna go into all of it. The bottom line, they don't understand. So you walk in your place, you walk in your space, let that be their issue, but get yours. Yeah. And yours is that you are a veteran, regardless of component. Yeah. Okay. I understand, but the key factor is when you're applying for something. Okay, this, when you're applying yeah. for something. Yes, and again, I'm applying, I'm talking about the medical arena and also the education. This is where I'm running into issues. So you're okay. not eligible for the uh, 
from uh, post 9-11 GI yeah. Bill or anything? And there's a gray area, even though I was working in that area of a uh, pure legal JAG as well. Well, I think there's a DVOP here who can yes, help you. Right. Because, <laughs> yeah. NVA. But you there are enough If there's a gray area. Right. We'll make sure that we share cards because yeah. I've seen I've been given the hook. But on behalf of all of the Thank panelists you. here, I want to say that we are so honored to be here. All of us, we took that plunge early one morning. We went to either a recruit training center, we went to an officer candidate school, or we went to an island. However we went, we went. And we're so honored to have been here today. Thank you. Thank you very, very much to our panelists. But before we, we break, I do want to bring to the stage Assistant Secretary Lowry of Vets to bring a few words. Hi, good, good morning, everyone. I, I just want to say thank you. Um, your trailblazers, your warriors, your leaders, um, it's really inspiring. Uh, and, and what's um, to me so hopeful to hear is how much progress has been made, but how much opportunity still remains. And, uh, you know, at, at VETS, um, you know, our vision is that every American veteran lives up to her or her, his or her potential. And I uh, heard a lot of, lot of great work that's going to move us further in that direction. Um, and we've got a lot of good lessons here today to help us with our work to get towards that mission. And the thing I'm going to take away here most today is those four bones of yours, because <laughs> I like that. Anyway, so th thanks for the Women's Bureau. Congratulations on 100 years. Uh, thanks for the VETS team that helped put this together as well. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to say those few words. And now I'll introduce Paris Mack, who will give us uh, some thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Wasn't this an amazing event? <laughs> My name is Paris Mack, and I'm the administrative officer at the Women's Bureau. It's an honor to be here today as a member of the Women's Bureau staff, but also as an Army veteran. On behalf of the Women's Bureau, Director Dr. Laurie Todd Smith, who was unable to join us today, and myself, I want to thank our moderator and panelist, Dr. Mosley Brown, Dr. Terrell Harris, retired Command Sergeant Major Jones, and retired Command Sergeant, Ma excuse me, Command Master Chief <laughs> Harris <laughs> for sharing their stories about serving in the military with honor and distinction. I would also like to thank CC for her remarks. <laughs> thank you, Cece. And a big thanks to Dr. Nancy Glowacki and the Veterans Employment and Training Service for partnering with us today. Thank you all for taking time from your busy schedules to commemorate African American History Month, and in particular, women in service. A special thanks to the Women's Bureau staff who helped organize this event. Amy, Marzi, Tiffany, Angela, and Sherry. <laughs> this event could not have happened without your hard work and dedication. We are proud of our accomplishments at the Women's Bureau. We're proud of the work we have done with women veterans and with military spouses and look forward to working with you in the future. As a reminder, I encourage you to help celebrate our centennial by participating in our interactive campaign. Our purpose, your work. We're sure you have a story to share. Please go to www.dol.gov forward slash WB100. Thank you and have a wonderful day.